here are the 2020 AC List guidelines for cardiac arrest. If you're like me, you look forward to these new guidelines every five years to find out what the brightest minds in the field of ACLS have come up with so that we clinical healthcare professionals can bring those pulseless patients back to life. It's a thing of beauty. One solid page of colorful boxes, lightning bolts, and arrows acting as a blueprint of how we can all be heroes. The only problem is, ACLS thinks PEA and ACISLI are the same thing, and they are wrong. Let's take a look. On the left side of the algorithm are the shockable rhythms. Here is ventricular fibrillation. The ACLS guidelines definitely have it right when it comes to VFib and VTAC. Some genius who deserves a Nobel Prize figured out that if you electrocute patients with a defibrillator, you can convert the pulseless rhythms into a sinus rhythm and get their pulse back. Those lightning bolts printed on the algorithm should be five times the size to emphasize the main intervention in treating and saving people in VFib arrest. And if you follow this algorithm, you can save a whopping 33% of these patients. Turns out though, that if you have your VFib arrest in a casino, this 2000 New England Journal of Medicine study shows that you have a 59% chance of surviving. So you should probably go to a casino if you think you're gonna have your VFib arrest. On the right side of the algorithm, there are the non-shockable rhythms. Here is asystole. The ACLS guidelines also have it right when it comes to asystole, but not in a good way for your patients. Your chance of surviving an asystolic arrest is less than 1%. Since these patients are obviously dead and have no electrical activity on their monitor, it seems reasonable to do CPR, give epinephrine, and try to reverse what is causing the arrest. But here is where I have a problem with the ACLS guidelines. This is PEA. The most complex, intriguing, and fascinating cardiac arrest rhythm. No two PEA rhythms are alike. The management of one PEA rhythm may be completely different from another. And to make it even more exciting, some people who appear to be in PEA are not even dead and had a pulse the entire time. So how does ACLS handle the uniqueness of PEA? They decided to just throw PEA into the same category as asystole. PEA's algorithm is identical to asystole, and the expected treatment is identical. In the world of ACLS, PEA is equal to asystole. This is equivalent to treating your two children exactly the same and not recognizing their individual uniqueness that make them special. In my opinion, the two rhythms are not equal and should be treated as separate entities with separate approaches and management. Let's take a look. Here's the problem. If a 60-year-old male is unresponsive in the recess room and is hooked up to the monitor, and the monitor shows this sinus rhythm, your next step should be to feel for a pulse. So what would you do if the patient does not have a pulse? Well, you would follow the ACLS guidelines for PEA. You would start CPR, you would give a milligram of epinephrine IV every three minutes, and think of your reversible causes known in the ACLS circles as the H's and T's. And if you did that, the patient will survive less than 5% of the time, probably closer to 2 to 3% of the time. But say you did feel a pulse. Well, you would do something completely different. You would get a full set of vitals, start IV fluids, and IV pressors, and other emergency treatment if needed, and find the cause of their unresponsive state by doing tests. This person's chance of survival is much higher than 5%. So the pulse check is the most critical step in determining management. So let's see how pulse checks usually go in unresponsive patients. Okay, two minutes are up. Okay, let's hold compression and check, check a rhythm. We have a rhythm. Uh, can I get someone to please check a pulse? Not sure if I feel one. Yeah, I feel one. I feel one. Nope, I don't feel one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel one. Yeah. I think there's a strong result. I'm not sure. I, I can't wait. feel much here. So wait, just, well, I, just to clarify, 
Do we feel a pulse? No. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure we have all been there, thinking we might have felt a pulse, but not 100% sure. Because healthcare professionals suck at feeling for pulses. Multiple studies done in different decades have shown around the same number. Healthcare professionals are only accurate at feeling a pulse around 50% of the time. You might as well flip a coin to determine if the patient has a pulse. So even if this patient doesn't have a palpable pulse, they still may not be in true PEA. About half may have a pulse that you are not feeling, and they may actually be alive. This is called pseudo-PEA. It looks and feels just like PEA, but it is not. The ACLS guidelines just assumes that healthcare professionals are accurate in their pulse check assessments and apply the algorithm only to those that are truly pulseless and that everyone who we can't feel a pulse in is in true PEA. If only it were that simple. So how can you distinguish true PEA from pseudo-PEA? Well, they look the same, and they both have organized activity on the monitor, and they feel the same as both do not have palpable pulses. The big difference is in the detection of output. In true PEA, there is no palpable pulse and there is no output that can be detected. In pseudo-PEA, there is no palpable pulse, but you can detect output by other means. This patient is alive, but you just can't feel a pulse. Think of pseudo-PEA as a severe shock state and not a cardiac arrest state. And we have known about pseudo-PEA for decades, and it has been around since we used to call PEA electrical mechanical dissociation back in the 1990s. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. What difference does it make if there's output or not? If we don't feel a pulse, shouldn't we just do CPR anyway? Well, multiple studies have demonstrated that doing CPR in the setting of pseudo-PEA can lead to harm and affect filling of the heart and affect the cardiac output. So there must be other strategies of managing pseudo-PEA. First, let's find ways to determine if there is output when we can't palpate a pulse. One way is to use an art line. This would probably be the gold standard in recognizing output if you cannot feel a pulse. An arterial line will tell you beat by beat the waveform of the pulse and a blood pressure. If the art line is flat, there is no output. If there's a waveform and a blood pressure reading, there is output. Another way to assess for output is the use of end tidal CO2. If a patient is pulseless and having no output, the end tidal CO2 waveform will be flat and there will be no end tidal readings because there is no gas exchange and no circulation of blood. Now, if the patient's a CO2 retainer, there may be some false readings, so this is not a perfect monitoring system. But if the patient does have output, the end tidal CO2 will have a waveform and corresponding CO2 levels. But let's get to a readily available tool that can easily tell us if the patient has a pulse. POCUS. Applying gentle pressure over the carotid artery with the linear probe will rapidly tell you if the patient has output. This can be done well within the 10 second pulse check maximum ACLS suggests. In this case, when pressure is applied over the carotid, it fully collapses and there is no pulsations. This is true PEA without any evidence of output. Here is an example of detecting a pulse when you place the linear probe over the artery. You can clearly see the pulsations of the artery. This would be what pseudo-PEA looks like with POCUS. Now here they are side by side. On the left, there is no pulsation and the carotid artery flattens like a pancake with gentle pressure. On the right, the artery cannot be compressed and pulsations are clearly evident. So now, if you see this rhythm and unsure if a pulse is present, just use your POCUS. In this case, there is clearly a pulsating pulse. This is not a cardiac arrest state, but a severe shock state. So now what? Well, some people want to start CPR because a pulse is not palpable. Some people want to hold CPR and do other things to help the patient.
Regardless if you are in the camp of doing CPR, which potentially may be harmful in pseudo-PEA, or in the camp of holding CPR, one thing you should definitely not do is give one milligram of epinephrine. Instead, open your fluids wide open and start an infusion of pressors like 10 micrograms per minute of norepinephrine. By the next pulse check, you will likely be feeling a palpable pulse as output increases. The other beauty of using POCUS is that it is excellent in determining the cause of the hypotension in the severe shock state of pseudo-PEA. By performing a RUSH exam, which stands for Rapid Ultrasound in Shock, the cause of the shock can be readily identified and interventions can be performed immediately at the bedside. Just remember the acronym HIMAP because you want a high mean arterial pressure. It will also tell you which areas of the body to scan to look for causes of hypotension. You can look at the heart for pericardial effusion suggesting tamponade, and also for RV strain to suggest pulmonary embolism. You can look at the IVC to see if it is empty or plethoric. If it's empty, it suggests sepsis or hypovolemia. If it's plethoric, it suggests obstructive causes like PE and tamponade. You can look in the right upper quadrant at Morrison's pouch for free fluid, which would suggest intra-abdominal bleeding as the cause for the shock. You can look at the aorta for any aneurysms to suggest a AAA. And finally, you can look at the lung for pneumothorax to suggest a tension pneumothorax is the cause of the shock. So here is a look at how I think PEA should be treated. If it's determined to be true PEA on POCUS, follow your ACLS algorithm. Start CPR, give one milligram of epinephrine every three minutes, and think of your reversible causes. Sadly, less than 5% will survive. If you see a pulse with POCUS, treat as a severe shock state. Start fluids and norepinephrine infusion, and use POCUS to do a rush exam to find the cause of the shock. Surely more than 5% of these patients should survive. Now let's look at a recent case I had where I used a POCUS pulse check to diagnose pseudo-PEA and then did a rush exam to diagnose the cause of shock. In this case, a patient had a syncopal episode in triage and was brought to our recess room. Nobody could feel a pulse, and I was asked if we should start CPR. The monitor showed this sinus tachycardia rhythm. I did a POCUS pulse check and could see pulsations and could tell this was pseudo-PEA. We held off on CPR while I did a rush exam. Had we started CPR and followed the ACLS PEA guidelines, the patient would have had less than a 5% chance of surviving. Her heart scan showed a large RV, and her IV scan showed a plethoric IVC. Here's the large IV right here, quite dilated showing RV strain, and here's a very plethoric IVC. This is very much in keeping with a pulmonary embolism. The rest of the rush exam was normal. We gave her thrombolytics, and within five minutes, she had a normal blood pressure. She was admitted to the hospital and discharged from hospital on day two, neurologically intact. Now let's look at another case. A patient is admitted to the medicine service but due to lack of beds has remained in the hospital's emergency department overnight. At nursing handover, the patient is found unresponsive and no pulse is palpable and the nurse starts CPR and calls for the emergency doctor. The patient is placed on the monitor and a rhythm check and pulse check are performed. An organized rhythm is seen, but no pulse is palpable. A POCUS pulse check is performed and no carotid pulsations are seen. As you can see, the carotid artery flattens like a pancake. This is true PEA. CPR is restarted, and one milligram of epinephrine is given every three to five minutes. The reversible causes are all thought of, including a pocus of the heart to look for tamponade and findings of PE, as well as a lung ultrasound to look for pneumothorax. Unfortunately, no reversible cause is found, and the patient ultimately dies of his PEA arrest.
Now let's look at one final case. This is probably the most common case that I have seen. An 80-year-old female comes into hospital feeling weak and unwell. She has been taking Tylenol for general aches and pains and hasn't been eating much in the past two days. Her daughter found her drowsy and confused and called 911. She had a GCS of 10, temperature of 37.2 degrees Celsius, heart rate of 125, blood pressure of 60 over 30, and paramedics brought her to the hospital. During transport, the patient became unresponsive and the primary care paramedics were not sure if they could feel a pulse. They initiated CPR. When they arrived to the hospital, a rhythm and pulse check was performed by the physician. She was found to be in sinus tachy around 125 beats per minute, but no palpable pulse was palpable. A POCUS pulse check was then performed. Pulsations could be seen in the carotid, and the patient was determined to be in pseudo-PEA. A decision was made to treat this patient as a severe shock state and not a cardiac arrest state. Fluids were opened wide, and a request was made for 10 micrograms per minute of norepinephrine. Since mixing up the norepinephrine infusion takes a few minutes, one dose of 10 micrograms of push-dose epi was given while a rush exam was performed. This is a much smaller dose than the one milligram of IV epinephrine that is used in true PEA. In the rush exam, the heart appeared normal other than being tachycardic. There was no LV dysfunction, no RV strain, and no pericardial effusion. The IVC looked quite empty. The right upper quadrant was normal and there was no free fluid in the abdomen. The aorta was normal and there was no evidence of a AAA. There was normal lung sliding bilaterally and there was no pneumothorax. The only finding on the rush exam was an empty IVC. This signified volume depletion. The differential for this finding includes hemorrhagic shock, hypovolemic shock, and sepsis. Since the patient had no history of bleeding, trauma, vomiting, or diarrhea, the patient was treated as sepsis and broad-spectrum antibiotics were ordered in addition to the fluids and pressors. Shortly after the pressors were started, a palpable pulse was easily palpable and the patient had a blood pressure of 80 over 40. Fluids and pressors were titrated to a systolic blood pressure greater than 90, and the patient was admitted to the ICU. She grew E. coli in her blood cultures, improved over the next few days, and was discharged home from hospital neurologically intact on day 8. Had we followed the ACLS guidelines in this case and started CPR and given 1 mg of epinephrine when we weren't sure if the patient had a pulse, it would have likely caused a palpable pulse on the next pulse check, as one milligram of epinephrine is a large dose and would have likely created a palpable pulse. However, giving one milligram of epinephrine as a bolus to someone who already has a pulse, just so you can more easily palpate it, is like using piptazo when all you need is polysporin, or using a flamethrower when all you need is a lighter. This high dose of epinephrine given to a patient with a pulse can cause coronary and cerebral ischemia and worsen the chances of favorable neurological outcome. In this case, by diagnosing this patient as pseudo-PEA, the patient was treated as a severe shock state and had a favorable neurological outcome. In summary, when you have PEA on the monitor, manual pulse checks are unreliable. POCUS can help distinguish true PEA from pseudo-PEA. If you suspect pseudo-PEA, consider it a severe shock state and not a cardiac arrest case. Whether you do CPR or not, we'll leave up to you, but I recommend no epinephrine as one milligram boluses. I recommend opening the fluids and running infusions of norepinephrine, the same thing you would do in a shock state. And don't forget to use your POCUS. You can do a rush exam to look for the cause of shock. If you treat all PEA arrests the same, true PEA and pseudo-PEA, less than 5% of these patients survive.
recognizing and treating pseudo-PEA differently than true PEA will increase survival rates, as pseudo-PEA patients are not dead yet. So, don't be satisfied with the status quo. Less than 5% of your patients will survive when the ACLS-PEA algorithm is applied. Let's go after the other 95%. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me at pocuscases at gmail.com.